So, cool. yeah, when you're ready to go. Cool. Hi guys, today I'm joined by Chris, um, he's my uh, health and fitness coach, he's helping me with some nutrition stuff at the moment, uh, great coach, highly recommend him, and he's going to talk us through today how uh, nutrition and psychology and certain elements of emotional reactions and complex post-traumatic stress disorder can feed back into uh, eating and, and food choices. So the first question I got for you is, uh, do you see in your clients, emotional issues, uh, creating overeating and a desire for bad food. Okay, so the overeating issue being the first question, but if you take one thing away from this video today, that food dictates mood, and as we're talking, continue to think about the idea that food dictates mood from a base level. So obviously there can be lots of psychological issues like uh, Richard spoke about already in other videos, but the food dictates mood can influence a lot of things within your within your lifestyle. Um, so if I just talk about first of all where I'm coming from, we use evidence-based practice, which is basically the personal needs of a person combined with the experience of what we do as coaches and the evidence. The evidence being the most important thing, modern evidence, not evidence from a long time ago which is what's mostly used in the fitness industry. Some people who aren't familiar with the fitness industry probably won't, they won't get that. They'll be like, of course it's evidence-based. What else could it possibly be? Okay. Could you explain what happens in the fitness industry that's the what else could it possibly be? Okay, so if you, try and, if you can imagine that um, there's so many people trying to make money out of fitness because everybody wants to be health and, healthy and fit. Um, more so people want to be healthy and we'll always go to what I call the one thing. And the one thing sells. And we have a pyramid within Empowered by Lifting which is talking about what's most important and supplements being the least important thing. Everyone goes to the one thing because of the way the fitness industry is set up. Right. So it's usually the sales funnel that makes people buy the one thing and it's not really that that's going to make the difference, it's the ground up. But unfortunately, people time, pull tiny bits of evidence from 20 years ago, maybe, just to sell that one product. Right. It might be a mood product, it might be to help you feel better, it might be more energy, it might be fat loss or, or whatever. So, go back to the psychological question of food you spoke about. Mm -hmm. I've got a little bit, some little notes here, by the way. Can I just explain that one, that expand on it a little bit? If you want to relate it to something that I've talked about in another video, there is a uh, preponderance, like uh, it's, it's almost like a logical fallacy within the brain to desire a simple solution, especially in the face of complex problems. And the nutrition thing is a complex problem, isn't it? Yes. Overall, it's a complicated problem. So you're going to want a fast, simple solution, but there isn't one. But the people out there who are cynical and know that the human brain, the human system, desires these uh, simple solutions, they push simple solutions. I'll say, just eat these berries and all will be well. I don't even know how to pronounce those berries, but they were everywhere a few years ago, weren't they? They were advertised like, is it acai or acai berries? Acai berries. Acai yeah. berries. <laughs> and they are, they're the answer to everything. Everything is fine if you just eat one of them, problem solved. Which, don't get me wrong, it's a very good food and it's healthy, but if you're not looking at the whole holistic approach to the diet from the ground up, um, which it might be nice if I put a link in the bottom to one of our pyramids which you can click on, maybe you can have a look and put it in another window while we're talking and see the different levels of where we're talking from, where the supplements are at the top being the least important, where the why, which we'll talk about a little bit later, adherence and mindset being more important for health and fitness. So we'll talk about that. But the stimulatory behaviour, what Richard just kind of touched on through your other videos, um, is kind of a, a way of talking about the ego, which I believe you already spoke about as well. Mm -hmm. If you're, my perception of the ego, put really simply, is your perception of who you are as a person. So if you're always protecting that in a, a insecure manner, which is normal, it's not your fault, it's just the way people are brought up within society, you're kind of self-protecting all the time. So if you're protecting the ego and that trying to find a stimulation for that ego all the time, 
as well as protecting it, then that can have issues with 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 overeating and, and things like this as well, which we're going to go into in a second. So if you manage to kind of remove remove your ego, so you're not really protecting it, you're not stimulating it all the time. Ideally, that creates happiness, which is a long, long journey. I'm still on the journey, and I've been doing it for two or three years. Just remove the ego. Just remove it. It'd be so easy if you could. <laughs> <Just like that. laughs> so. Um, it's the idea is to work towards removing the ego or at least parts of it so if you're not then stimulating the ego which is really hard to explain how not to do that because it just takes time mm -hmm. ideally you're not going to you're not going to be emotional eating um, and then you were talking about a very specific food so the the actual food which is normally triggered and eaten is normally the food that you restrict. Right. So it's different for every single people, every single person. So for example, my personal food, when I made all the mistakes, when I was 20, 21, uh, I'm now 31, so all of the mistakes I made would have been cereal. I love cereal. Any cereal I can get my hands on, I love it. So if I restrict myself from cereal, I'm more likely to binge on cereal if I feel bad. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if I was dieting, I would diet, 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 get to the point where I'd find myself in the kitchen, filling my face with whatever cereal was in the kitchen, and then I'd fill a bowl, and then I'd put milk in the bowl, and then I might as well have a bowl anyway, and I would overeat. Now, the complete opposite to that, we teach people how to understand the 80-20 rule which is 80% whole food. So when ex let me explain whole, whole food. Whole food being a one ingredient food. So what's a one ingredient food? Apple. Apple, potato, <laughs> chicken, tomato, vegetable, mm. healthy food. We know what that is. 20% being whatever the hell you want. Right. So for me, that would be cereal. Mm -hmm. And the longer you can eat whatever the hell you want within 20% of your diet, the longer you probably gonna the, the, the longer it takes before you end up binging on that food. It might take a few weeks, a few months. Eventually, you don't need it to right. binge on it anymore. To the point where I took a client, James, who was twenty two stone, really really overweight, and as he came on board, his calories were set quite high because he was quite heavy, and he managed to eat a Snickers every single day. And I made him do that until he didn't need to eat Snickers anymore. So this might sound really... You made him do that within the context of the 80-20 rule. He was 80% eating mm. good food, but he had to have this yeah. naughty food every day. Yeah, and eventually he didn't need to do it anymore. Right. Um, I've, I've, talked, I've talked on the channel before about creating a resistance to something. It creates like a sexy taboo. Like, don't eat the chocolate cake, and then it's all you're thinking about is like, oh, the delicious yeah, fucking exactly. chocolate cake. Whereas if you go, just eat it, but the rest of the day, you're going to be eating healthy. Yeah. You're not building up that psychological resistance so much, are you? You just, you just do it. Okay, it's part of your diet. You can do it now. I like that sexy taboo analogy. I use uh, the kryptonite food. So right. It's something that's really weak. Yeah, it's, it's going to weaken you by eating that. And obviously, everybody wants to be healthy. And they, know, they really know that they're doing bad to themselves when they eat that bad food. Mm -hmm. But you just can't help it. It's normal. I did it. Right. And the way I've lived for a long, long time is I don't need to now. Um, so, if I now give you a few tools that you could maybe use. Oh, could I just quickly ask you, the kryptonite food and the bad food, does it tend to be a high carbohydrate, high processed food? And is that, I'm just conjecture on my part now, does it release opiates or something? If you, do you, like, what, if you eat like loads of cake or cereal or something, is it, is it the carbohydrate? Does it have a certain feeling in your body or that, that your brain releases when you eat this stuff? I'm going to say straight away uh, endorphins are released. Right. By you, but it's probably because you've got some sort of psychological attachment to that food. Right. There is certain hormonal adaptations you can have from foods. Right. Like let's say for example a high carbohydrate food would mm. release leptin which is the fed, fed hormone. So mm -hmm. you feel like you've, you're fed. Mm -hmm. That's probably not anything to do with the overeating. Okay. of the food it's not it's something normally that you restricted yourself from and you'd like to eat right so out of hundreds and hundreds of people I've dealt with there's never anything that jumps out on a particular food no it's like 
And I always try to find out what it is. Does like, anybody love carrots? Are they just like <laughs> gorging on carrots? <laughs> What's well, the most unusual? Um, Max the dog is the only person I know who is, that's his kryptonite, it's carrots. carrots. I, I think it's the, uh, it's the crunch. crunch. Yeah, yeah. There's currently um, some research going on in the sens sensation of food going in your mouth, right. which is something I'm working on at the moment with some people, which is eating, like for me, cereal. Mm. So do I like the crunch? It's crunchy. So yeah. could I replace that with crunchy vegetables? Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. And we can work towards 100% clean by, mm -hmm. that, by doing this. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not sure. So mm -hmm. that's just something that's, that's, it's not unsure about at the moment. Mm -hmm. But, um, would you say it's worth people watching this to sit there and go, well, what, what, my thing would be uh, cookies and ice cream, or maybe ice cream that has been built with cookies in it. That's great. So if you actually sat there and went, whatever your kryptonite food is, what is it that I'm enjoying about this? What is the mm. thing that makes this so desirable and maybe if they start to break it down and deconstruct it maybe they could get some insight into it. Well going is. back to the first part of it about the stimulatory behaviour and you're trying to become happy from it. Right. So how long are you happy from eating your ice cream? Yeah. It's very temporary and the up follows by the down mm -hmm. and is the down bigger than the up? If you can iron it out so you're eating a little bit of ice cream every day it's mm -hmm. probably better than eating the big and the up. You just raised a really good point. There's two addictions that have been able to come over, that overcome that most people struggle with. One was smoking, and the other one was a drug that is generally popular in Liverpool, that I'm sure you're aware of. Mm. And I did it like that. I looked at it and I was like, well, where's the peak? Where's the high? How long does it last? How often do you feel that way? Versus all the other crap that goes with it. Mm -hmm. And just by looking at it, I, I didn't tell myself, don't smoke or don't do the other stuff. I was like, do it, but enjoy it. Okay. And notice how often you're really not enjoying it. You're trying. Like, every, I, I, I noticed that of 20 cigarettes I would smoke, maybe three of them were really good. Okay. And the others I was just hoping they would be good. <laughs> and that, like, that bowl of ice cream, maybe the first three spoonfuls are amazing. Yeah. And you kind of go a bit numb. Yeah, it's normal then. And full of self-hatred. <laughs> yeah. So what happens if there was no self-hate and there was no guilt? Yeah. And all of a sudden you were having... One bowl, one ball of ice cream every single day. Yeah. Until it's, ooh, it's just part of your life. Whole different concept of mm -hmm. food, um, and this is what we try to get across to people in, in seminars or in a couple of books that I've written. Is to make this whole way of eating guilt-free mm -hmm. is a big part of it. Mm -hmm. And if you're not guilted by food, and obviously the psychological aspect with what Richard does will probably increase and help you. Uh, psychologically as well. Well, the people who are suffering from emotional trauma, if they've got complex post-traumatic stress symptoms, guilt and shame is one of the biggest triggers they've got. Mm -hmm. So if they feel, they, there are people out there who are so built up with guilt and shame that if they feel just a tiny amount, like the guilt of eating one Oreo cookie too many, they can go into a spiral. They can right. really fit the fuck out. I was just going to say that, it spiral up. It's, it's, it's the same with people who are, in, who are coach who are just going for like, really really trying to become lean mm. if they make a mistake mm. and that can spiral into days of mistakes right rather than just going okay so let's take someone who's making a mistake every single week mm -hmm. and they a lot of people will do the once a week eat what they want mm -hmm. let's take that and spread it out during the week and then if they accidentally fall off and eat too much mm -hmm. how often is that happening is it once a week All okay right. Is it after you've been maybe I've been coaching a person for a while? Mm -hmm. If it's been like three or four weeks and you've never had a had a, a fall off the bandwagon, so to speak, mm -hmm. I'm like that's great yeah. because it's now longer. Yeah. So when I was younger, I would fall off the bandwagon all the time, right. all the time. Once a week, I'd just be like, ah, <laughs> screw the diet, <laughs> eat cereal. Yeah. So then, as that as I began to learn our methods, it was one month, mm -hmm. two months, mm -hmm. never. Right. Eventually I'm never. So I'm just at a constant right. control of where I want to be, psychologically and uh, physiologically. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like working towards that. Um, so if I go ahead and give some tools of how yeah. to do that, cool. just so they've got some value from the video. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, if we look at the world where we are now, uh, as of 2015, oh. Profitability, productivity, mm -hmm. they've both risen so high to the point where it's everything is, is, is arbitrage, it's trying to sell something. 
technology is also driven, 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 risen, risen with it. Mm -hmm. So let's use the technology. Mm -hmm. If you were to get your mobile phone, nearly everybody's got a mobile phone now. Mm -hmm. Download My Fitness Pal. Uh, we'll put a link in the bottom for that as well. Mm -hmm. you, maybe you've already used it or you've tried it. And then basically start using My Fitness Pal to track your foods. So ignore My Fitness Pal with the calories it gives you because it doesn't know. It, it's impossible to know what calories a person needs. And, oh yeah, you mean ignore it in terms of its recommendations? Its recommendations. My Fitness Pal is a fucking mess for a lot of things. It's yeah. great for tracking calories and macros. Everything it's else it tries to do. It's a diary. It's a diary. So, Don't use it for anything else. So that's the first thing. So then if you take your body weight in pounds, times it by, we've got three life type of lifestyle multipliers. 13, if you're just sitting down, you don't do anything for a job. Mm -hmm. 14, if you go to the gym, maybe once or twice a week, or you do some exercise, maybe you do quite a long walk, uh, or you've got a physical job. 15, if you go to the gym and you do a, a lot of a physical activity during the week. Mm -hmm. And that's it. So most people will be 14. Mm -hmm. So you take your body weight in pounds times by 14. That alone will be high mm -hmm. because of what the fitness industry tries to force upon people. Right. So when you end up eating too, they end up forcing upon you a low calorie diet, which then makes you accidentally binge, then you feel bad, then mm -hmm. you're looking for the supplement to buy, then mm -hmm. you're looking for the fat burner, or if you don't binge, your energy is so low that you're looking for the supplement to give you energy, mm -hmm. and it's all kind of associated in, in supplements rather than setting a nice level of calories. Because they can't, they can't sell you on that. They yeah. can't sell, there's not going to be a full page ad taken out in an expensive popular magazine that says, hey, just... Just eat calories and eat natural Just food. eat properly. <laughs> no, they want to show you like a model yeah. with an eight pack who's probably yeah. been photoshopped anyway with a pill or a drink or some magic solution, exactly. isn't it? So now we've got a calorie number. Try your best you can to type in the foods that you eat and get used to it, first of all. That's mm -hmm. it. And start trying to hit that calorie number. It's the first level. We've got five levels within the Empower Lifting Lifestyle. Level one is to just, for everybody, to begin to learn how to understand food within... That takes that takes a few days, doesn't it? That's three yeah. or four days of getting used to. Because Chris got me doing that, and I was like, ugh, this is weird. I have to scan things and look them up. And then you just, it's just what you do. It just becomes what you do. Um, and then we talk about habit as well. Uh, ritual setting, um, which I'm sure you would have talked about in other videos at some point. Mm -hmm. um, Basically, a habit is something that is harder to do than to not to do. No, harder to not to do than to do. Mm -hmm. Get it the right way around. <laughs> so it's harder to not to do. So basically, there was a couple of books I, I, I read a couple of years back, which was suggesting that five days it takes to create a new habit, and you, you can only do one or two at a time. Mm -hmm. So there's no point me giving you loads of tools to start a new fitness lifestyle or to help your fitness lifestyle because that's too many things and most people wouldn't be able to handle that unless you've done it already. So that's why we have the five levels to help you gradually build up throughout the levels. Um, so you've now got the, um, the new habit of starting to track your calories. Mm -hmm. Then if you can add another, another habit onto that, Put your set of scales in your bathroom, put them in front of your, in front of your toilet, <laughs> so then you get used to getting weighed every day. Mm -hmm. Everyone's going, why are you so obsessive? <laughs> so what I call it is you're so obsessed with your weight, you're going to be unobs you're going to be not obsessed. Mm -hmm. And that's because what we do is we take an average weight and not a daily weigh-in. Because what you'll notice is every day you get on the scales, you'll be up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. And it's impossible to know what you weigh on a week so then what you do, add the seven together, divide by seven, get your average. If you miss one, divide by six, mm -hmm. just a basic average. Take the two from each other and see if you're going up or down. Ideally, no more than 1% drop mm -hmm. because... In a week. In a week, mm -hmm. because evidence shows us that any more than 1% is not from fat. So we're on about fat loss here, not weight loss. So... Um 
So a person who's watching this, uh, say uh, there's a lady watching this, she's, I don't know, 170 pounds. She's times that weight of 170 pounds by 14. Yes. She's got a number, which will be whatever whatever that number is. Then she's to track everything on MyFitnessPal and then weigh herself every day. Yeah. Um, fairly straightforward. Some people would be saying, well, isn't that going to make you... And this is all the all the stuff I see the common rebuttals online. Isn't that going to make you obsessed with weight? And as you just said, you're so obsessed, you're unobsessed, right? Because you get on a scale, it's different every day. You're just like, oh, yeah, I don't know what to weigh. Yeah, and then you'll be surprised at when you take the average weight and what it actually is. Yeah, even if you think you've been up that week, you can still be down right. because of the way it, it's it's a it's a quite a modernised way of weighing yourself. Okay. So if she was 165 pounds and it's you don't want to see more than a 1% drop in a week, that's 1.6. Okay, cool. 1.6. Not, not comfortable with maths. <laughs> I hate maths, but because I've done it so often, it's quite easy. Right. Yeah. Um, okay, so then we kind of move on to the yo-yo diet analogy. And my book was called uh, End the Yo-Yo Diet. Right. Uh, and Challenge the Known. Right. Because everyone knows what fitness is yeah. because of the way the fitness industry f forces it on people mm -hmm. and most of it's wrong yeah we've quite discussed that already yeah it's not organic and its primary purpose is actually not to help people lose weight it's to make money yes and if it was about helping people to genuinely lose weight if they only got paid when people lost weight the whole fucking marketing strategy would the, the environment would totally change wouldn't yeah. it yeah we've got something quite cool on the website as well which is um we're trying to help the world lose a million pounds. Right. Not of money, um, but we're trying to help the world lose a million pounds. And the page on the top, it says the million pounds page. If you click on that, you'll see the timer counting, the, the counter counting how many people have lost weight. And it's not us putting that on there, which is what most of the fitness industry does. Mm -hmm. It's the actual person who's lost the weight. And they're clicking on add themselves. Mm -hmm. Then you'll see on there all the pictures are really like different sizes and not very good, but they've put their before, they've put their after, they've put the weight they've lost, mm -hmm. and then you've put a little story. Right. So you feel free to have a little read through the stories and mm -hmm. see how they've used some of these tools. You might have only read the book, you might have been coached, you might have done various seminars, and you might have done different things, but you can see what they've actually done. Mm -hmm. And then I don't do that, they do it. So it's yeah. like not fixed like most yeah, yeah. fitness industry is it's quite powerful you're saying that the before and after photos that you get from some fitness experts and products that are you suggesting they're fixed in some way well <laughs> you know i'm not going to name any names <laughs> it, i mean for, for those of you who are watching this and you're not particularly interested in fitness exercise it's a very well known it's it's irritates me no end but very typical marketing strategy where they play around with before and after photos to say, hey, if you buy the um, doobity do 78 for $100 from us today, you'll go from looking like this to that. And you've got, they use all kinds of tricks, don't they? They use people with very low body fat percentages pushing out their bellies and then they grease them up for the next photo, give them a tan, sort of change the lighting from up to down. Or they do actually lose the weight. Right, right. Or They've lost the weight, but then what happens a few months afterwards, right? Or a few weeks afterwards, or days afterwards? This, this it's, it's, it's. You get the same thing with uh, in psychology. Like there's people who they do life coaching, they teach recovery from trauma, that kind of thing, and it's very easy to run a seminar or give somebody a therapy session and have them peak up massive amounts of motivation, huge amounts of recovery from trauma, and then they just without contact with that person, boom, just comes right back down again. Wow, interesting. Yeah, it's really easy to peak. Because you're in a group environment, you get the endorphins going, we can do this, guys, can't we? Yeah, great. And that's the Saturday, and then Tuesday, rainy morning, back in, you know, wherever they live. Yeah, they're on their own, awesome. and they're, they're just, it's just them. We talk about, uh, in the Level 5 seminars, we talk about managing your willpower. Right. And not living on your willpower. Right. Which is something that, taken away from not needing to eat clean all the time, or eating the whole food, you can eat a bit of chocolate if you want to. You're not living on willpower. If I could ask you, to, would it? Does it screw up your sequence if I say, could you talk about the willpower a bit more now? Not really. No, yeah. I don't think um, we we had much. I don't think I had much notes on willpower anyway. Oh, okay. Um, willpower. Um, how I explain willpower is like a muscle. So, if you were to let's say what everybody knows, everyone knows how to what a squat is. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to squat halfway down mm -hmm. and hold it 
at some point you're going to have to stand back up or sit down you're going to become tired right <laughs> even if there's no weight you're going to yeah. have to do something yeah that's like kind of the analogy to think about willpower and a lot for psychological issues and, and yeah. what you're doing as yeah. well it's if you are living on willpower all the time although it's okay to live on power or willpower but to know that it's going to fall off and yeah. you're gonna you're going to fall off the bandwagon with willpower so I would take clients and make sure that they're not continuously dieting, which is not not known in, in, in fitness. It's like, I want you to diet down if you want. If you want to diet, you diet down. Mm -hmm. And then no one talks about coming back up. Right. So ideally, we teach people to be able to bring their body fat level a little bit lower. And normally we recommend 15 weeks. Mm -hmm. And then 15 weeks of bringing the calories up slowly, mm -hmm. and because they're coming up slowly with the, meta uh, the calories, the metabolism, the feel good factors, the hormones, the lots of adaptions, the psychological aspect to eating more food, all becomes a lot, a lot more enhanced. Yeah. And ideally, the body fat level stays maybe two, three, four pound more, mm -hmm. not 30, 40 pound by finishing yeah. the diet. Yeah. So, what happens then is we do 15 weeks up, 15 weeks down, 15 weeks up, 15 weeks down mm -hmm. for the average person. And all that's different for somebody like me is as an athlete, I will do 15 weeks down and then another 15 weeks down. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much it, the difference. That's because you're competing. And I compete as a, as a natural bodybuilder. Right. Yeah. Right. So it's like understanding that is, is quite a different outlook. They've, they've, they've done research, uh, some research out there said that they might actually uh, through neuroscience who's kind of be able to find out uh, where the willpower is coming from they say it's a finite resource mm. there's evidence that suggests it's a finite resource so if you're using raw willpower sat there going i won't eat the cake but i know that i want it yeah sure you can do that for a week two weeks a finite amount of time and then that fuel that resource burns out okay and then when it's gone there's nothing to protect you from you know the the rebound so it's the same for for learning or or, or training or eating it, it goes into different areas like for example i've just managed my willpower recently mm -hmm. i start back on university because i'm doing a business degree on monday next week so for the past two weeks i've really relaxed on my reading i'm not doing any research i'm just dealing with my clients and I've done a lot of nothing mm -hmm. because I know for the next eight months I'm going to use my willpower up mm -hmm. and I know at some point I'm going to have to rest during that time and just do no thinking mm -hmm. and just relax mm -hmm. and that's where like meditation comes into it we teach a lot of that techniques and understanding the mind and, and stuff like that I don't know if you've ever gone into that with you, you guys yeah yeah, yeah. They, uh, they, we, we've talked about meditation and mindfulness and also uh, state management, a lot of people who suffered from emotional trauma, if they have the uh, CPTSD, they'll just go into self-abandonment. So if they need to do something that is difficult, they'll just throw themselves into it. Uh, what, do you, what do they used to call those Japanese fighter pilots that would crash into boats? Kamikaze? They do it kamikaze style. Like so, total self-abandonment, total suicide, death for the cause, hell for leather. Again, which will get you results. Mm. It will, for a time. And then there has to be a consequence to that, which is that you crash into a boat and die horribly in flames. Hmm, not cool. Because <laughs> um, you had loads of questions, but I think I've pretty much... Well, I was going to ask you how your method uh, tries to deal with the, the pattern of emotional eating as a way of pe people managing their own uh, uh, psychological states. But I think you've I mean, yeah, given us some tools for that. Yeah, how we kind of use it. It's a combination of a, of a lot. Um, and I think, I mean, how long have we been going for now? Quite a while, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a, a star analogy where we use the, the Empower by Lifting, uh, mastering the Empower by Lifting star, which brings in body, mind, uh, psychological aspects, uh, happiness and motivation. And it's a nice video that I'll post in the bottom. Uh, we'll put a link in the bottom. You can have mm -hmm. a watch of that. But... It's Don't be put off by the fact it's called Empowered by Lifting, by the way. It's not just... It's about him being empowered, Yes. really. Yeah. So you could look at it in different ways and go, it's empowered by being lifted up. Mm -hmm. But just because a lot of our people lift, meaning they go to the gym and lift weights, mm -hmm. most of them are lifting because it gives psychological benefits in terms of endorphin release and something to progress towards, like we spoke earlier on about progression. Mm -hmm. It's that, as well as the athlete. 
Right. So it's a combination of a lot. That's why we have the levels. And you have a lot of female followers looking at your page. It looks about 50-50 guys and girls. I don't want people to watch this and go, it's just, just for guys, yeah, guys, two guys grunting it's, and it's nothing actually, barbells. It's actually more females, to be honest. Is it? Yeah. Right. Um, a lot of my personal clients are more females. Right. Um, right. I think that's just because of the way I explain things is quite understandable. Mm -hmm. I don't go into scientific detail too often because mm -hmm. people don't want to hear all that. Like, they, uh, they want to know that I've read it. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, I have the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Nobody, like, that's our job, isn't it? Yeah. We have to do the research and then yeah. digest that and then produce something that is understandable. Exactly. Because a lot of the fucking research isn't. <laughs> it's just written in gibberish. <laughs> like, I fall asleep with papers on me. Like, <laughs> what was I reading? Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think um, the take home message is to consider that food might dictate your mood, is what I said at the beginning. Mm -hmm. If you, even if you don't start to track your food, like I gave you the tools to be able to do, is to consider that sometimes if you've under eaten, you might overeat. Mm -hmm. If you've under eaten, you might feel worse just because you're not eating enough food. And combining that, might make you think actually maybe i need to eat more food yeah um then if we get really really advanced and we start talking about making sure you're getting a mixture of different types of fruit and veg everyone's just gone deaf by the way as soon as you say eat more fruit and veg everyone goes deaf why, why, why is that it's crazy and it's because i think your mum would always bring you up with eat more fruit and veg eat more fruit and veg mm. because it is the most important thing mm. <laughs> we need a, we need the vitamins um, well, you give you give people macro targets, don't you? And you give them fiber targets to hit. Fiber targets, yeah. And I'm, I, I look at my fiber targets from there, and I'm like, Jesus, how much vegetables? Because <laughs> everybody would, everybody knows me as a vegetable eater. Everybody's like, oh, Rich is so healthy; he's always eating fruit and veg. And I'm like, you have no idea. I'm nowhere near. Nowhere near it. You, I mean, you have to to live a long and healthy life and for your body to work. Whatever vegetables you're eating now. Just, just straight up double it. Yeah. So as, as, as you're building up throughout the, the levels, I mean, level one is just like track your calories, basically. As you're building up, it's like, because you're eating the 80-20, you're eating a fiber, you're going into real, real, real detail with nutrition. Mm -hmm. That's when we're talking about longevity, mm -hmm. and living a long, healthy life. Mm -hmm. And then we're looking at some clients. I got a, a message off a client yesterday or the day before, I think, and she was mm -hmm. like, I can't believe my nails are better. She was yeah. talking about her nails being better after yeah. about two months. Yeah. You've got skin, hair, nails, you've got yeah. all of the other aspects. and uh, Well, there's stuff otherwise that is in your system that is like rotting in there that shouldn't be in there, right? I mean, it should be coming out of you. <laughs> it isn't. That's it's not going to be good. about uh, constipation problems with, with clients. Yeah. I know we're going off topic a little bit, but the amount of clients that don't realise how much fibre they're not eating. Yeah. And it's yeah. like, all you need to do is just adjust your diet a little bit. Will that make you more... Well, there, there was a, I used to work in uh, schools. And I remember at, at the year after I stopped working in the schools, Jamie Oliver did his thing of trying to clean up the school uh, the food system. And he was telling horror stories of kids who had digestive problems that you would only normally see on a term uh, on a ward full of terminally ill people where they're taking so much morphine, their body locks up. Mm. And he's saying, we've got eight-year-olds, ten-year-olds with the same conditions because like yeah them. your body won't work on crisps chips and tango for the rest of your life it just can't it can't do it i mean it'd be awesome to do some work with with jamie oliver um i love his outlook on the way he talks on the, the ted talk he does mm -hmm. he talks about too much sugar in the diet mm -hmm. but realistically having too much sugar is irrelevant if the fiber's okay right because you can't eat too much sugar if your fiber's set right is that right well, the way you've, if, you're, if you're thinking about how you're eating fruit and veg, mm -hmm. it's, that's how you get your fibre. Right. So then, because you're eating fruit and veg and whole foods, mm -hmm. and then you follow the 80 20 rule as well, mm -hmm. you can't eat too much sugar, really. Right. Because you've eaten enough fibre. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. So, yeah. obviously, you can eat too much, but if, if you're not considering the other parts of the diet. Right. right. So, it's about eating the right amount of fibre to then combat the issue of sugar, mm -hmm. and then somehow looking at the calorific value of what the kids are eating in a day and right. not just the healthy 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 because mm -hmm. they can still be unhealthy right even if they're not because they might go home and eat unhealthy as well yeah yeah don't know how to bring this to school children but it would be something that I would if, if it could be presented in a way that the uh that, that everybody could get their heads around i think 
you know, the, the people would love, they would love to hear it because mm -hmm. uh, I look back and, and my childhood and the way I was raised and then me as an adult in my 20s, I was just, I'm not a stupid person and I'm not an ignorant person, but when it comes to nutrition, fuck, I was ignorant. Mm. And it, my, yeah, my, fam my family unit, ignorant people, just generally speaking, the level of ignorance is high when it comes to food. Most people, like if we went out and grabbed a bunch of people now and asked them some very simple questions about food, we'd get some horrendous answers, I'm yeah, sure. Exactly, exactly. Um, something else we didn't bring up was the, the why, which uh, oh, yeah. is on the bottom of the pyramid, which will be posted in the bottom. Um, the why is really important in just looking at a, a health point of view. If you have a big why that you want to be healthy for, so let's take your people who are watching this and their why might to be might like to be more psychologically sound. Mm -hmm. So they might want to feel better. Mm -hmm. That might be enough of a why to begin to eat healthier. Right. Because now you know that food is quite a dictator in mood, mm -hmm. that that might be a big enough why. So if you find yourself falling back into your old ways or backsliding um, to the old way of being, it might be nice to think, maybe I need a bigger why. Yeah. Some clients, I try to get them to, uh, if the, we have two types of personalities, what we deal with, uh, what we try to break people up into, and we call it a freedom creative, and we call it a detail planner. Mm -hmm. If you're a detail planner personality type, um, with how we coin it, basically, they would then like to write down five whys. Right quite long term ones, short ones, and usually push and pull motives. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've talked about push and pull motives. I've, to, I've touched on it. I, I got it all from uh, Anthony Robbins. He says yeah, pe too, yeah. pe people do anything if they have a good enough reason. And he talks about you've got to get leverage on yourself. You've got to sell your brain on the idea of doing anything. So if you have five really good reasons why your life will be awesome if you eat more carrots, and five reasons why your life is going to really suck if you don't eat those carrots, then you're probably going to eat more carrots. So then putting them on your mirror when you wake up in the morning and having your five and your five, just read one of them mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. And then when you feel like you're going to fall off the bandwagon, read one of them. So people who um, will, will write different ones down, it's really fascinating to see what they are. I, I can actually give uh, some of the, the my subscribers a good reason right now, which is that if you have CPTSD and you're trying to recover, going into an emotional flashback really uh, stops your recovery. Everybody knows that. It really will hold back your recovery. People with... CPTSD can't afford to take the same uh, sort of liberties as other people do. You can't drink as much alcohol, you can't take the drugs, you can't drink the caffeine that everybody, and you can't eat the junk food because you, you're sensitive. You're much more sensitive. Mm. Any advantage you can get in regulating your mood, you, you've got to take it. Every single advantage you can get. But in, in, that being I mean, said, it's important to regulate your food then. Yeah. For starters. Yeah. As the, as the base probably, mm -hmm. which might not have been thought about in, I know doctors and even um, psychologists, psychologi psych psychologists, psychologists, <laughs> might not even think about food as a starting point. I know, I know that doctors don't, it's incredible, I had uh, unfortunately a, a couple of people close to me pass away from cancer and when you talk to cancer specialists about like people coming out of surgery and they're, and they're going, here's some sticky toffee pudding with custard and you're like, why, why, why are you giving them, why are you giving them that? Well, it's rich in calories. It's like, good. <laughs> yes, it is. And is there any other reason? Any vitamins and minerals in there to help them? Stay no, healthy? no education for these people who've been in the uh, in the National Health Service system. Where a mate of mine was in it for five years, and it was in his bowel. It was in his fat cells and in his bowel. And I was like, well, did they teach you to? I, took, I watched them take a take a sample. This was in the in the last days, and I was looking at a sample. I was like, Fuck, it was like the wrong color to come out of his human being because of the medicine he was on. And I was like, have they told you uh, to eat like less chocolate? Because there's chocolate everywhere. Everybody feels sorry for him. Mm. So bring him chocolates. And he was like, no. Uh, and he was already on the morphine. His system was locking up. And I'm like, you do realize that chocolate will make you constipated? No, I don't know that. I was like, fuck. You do realize that if you are really dehydrated, you get constipated? No, I don't know that. Why haven't they told me that? And I'm like, I, I d there was no, in the Western model, it seems to be identify the problem, attack it. You know, we'll hit it with laser beams and fire x-rays through it and destroy every other cell in your body as well. But the suggestion 
that you maybe food. take a walk and eat some fucking carrots. People look at you like you're some mad hippie. Like, yeah. uh, we do real science here. We don't worry about that chakra bullshit. I was just um, saying to Richard before, because obviously I'm coaching him through some, some stuff myself. And it feels like a lot of the time I'm just saying a real logical answer to It's stuff. advanced common sense. You're giving me, it's not woo-woo, it's common sense. It's like, oh, oh yeah, oh, right, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> if we just take all of the craziness going on in the world, if we just break it down to, like, let's just get your diet right first. Yeah. On a really easy level. Yeah. And we've got the tools to do it now. Um, so, go Ob ahead and do it. Objectivity and structure um, is, is, is key to all this. It really is just advanced common sense. Uh, I highly recommend Chris as a coach because he's given me some objectivity and some structure because we trick ourselves. Um, I saw your mate posted a thing about body dysmorphia yesterday. Uh, it's very hard for us as human beings to see ourselves objectively. Yeah. You can have a sense of what you think you're eating. Oh, I'm eating so healthy, blah, blah, blah. Then you look at your calories and you're like, whoa, that's, and track them for a week. Like I did about three days ago and I was like, I ate a lot of fucking calories and I actually thought that I was much lower than that. Exercise, you can think you're doing low, you're working out loads and getting loads of calories burned and when you actually track it through, through an objective lens and with a structure, you see something completely different. So the, why I recommend Chris is the, is the it's, it's, it's life coaching basically, it's helping you to it's manage a, an entire lifestyle. So just to like say on that point, I'm actually personally very busy. I've got a lot, a lot of clients mm. and I like to be very, want make the client feel like I'm their only client. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very important for me that. Mm -hmm. So what I've done over the last year or so is I've really worked hard to find a group of coaches that do exactly the same as me. Mm -hmm. We now go on to seminars together and we present to, uh, we do it on Google Hangouts where mm -hmm. we present to a group of eight people, have it nice and intimate, they can be anywhere in the world. We do that. If you're not even interested in being on the seminar, you can watch the recorded version of the seminar. Mm -hmm. If you like to read, you can read the book that I wrote a few years ago, and then that's kind of moving away from being coaching. Mm -hmm. And then if you're local to Liverpool, we have a pretty huge event going off in February. You might like to come to that. Obviously, this is a this is 2015, that'll be 2016 February. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be on here for ages, so if you missed it, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah. Hello people in the future with your hoverboards. Yeah, they actually exist. Almost. Fuck. I'm, only joking. Pretty, I'm pretty close to it. I'm pretty close to it. Anyway, so if you do contact me, I probably will be able to fit you in somewhere. If not, I can definitely recommend one of our other coaches um, and there'll be something that we can help you with. Even going over to the group and just posting stuff and asking a few questions. All of my ex-clients are in there as well, who are now living a lifestyle and, and doing it on their own. They can answer your questions. So it's not as if you, you've got lots of tools and lots of things to, people to help you with it. Don't just leave it on the edge in the periphery as a blind spot, like, oh, I have to fix everything else, but not this. You gotta eat, like, you're gonna do it four or five times a day. You may as well take the time out to actually look at what you're doing with that. Mm. and. Seriously, it's, it's going to make a, a huge difference. So so it's not a diet and we're not forcing them upon you not eating chocolate. <laughs> yeah, you can eat chocolate on this diet. Yeah. Amazing. So <laughs> hope you've enjoyed that, guys. And um, if you found any value to it, perhaps copy and paste it, share it around to your friends. Do it. Um, yeah, hope you cool. enjoyed it. Thank you. I'll clip it there. Cool. Good. Enjoy that. I was supposed to time it. I have no idea. <laughs> no, 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 idea no, 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 no. Your thing has stopped recording. Mine ran out of space. Ah.